Amongst major developments in hardware and software, graphics technology in 2005 was moving at an even faster pace. The relative simplicity of GPU engines, coupled with new manufacturing nodes, would allow NVIDIA and ATI to pack more transistors and more horsepower onto a given piece of silicon. These transistors were arranged into a series of execution units called pipelines, with individual stages of the pipeline dedicated to particular parts of 3D rendering. These included vertex and pixel shading units handling the brunt of graphics processing, but eventually the needs of software dictated the requirement that all shading units should be able to handle all the same shading processes, also known as unified shading. Game visuals were becoming more complex, and simply adding more vertex and pixel shading units simply wasn't enough, hence the need for unified shading architectures. The days of dedicated vertex and pixel shaders were coming to an end, but not without a final hurrah. And that's where this, the Radeon X1800 XT, steps in, the top-of-the-line graphics card offered by ATI in October of 2005. Along with its brethren, the X1300 and the X1600 series, these were to be the last generation of ATI video cards to use discrete vertex and pixel shader units. As a second follow-on to the R300 architecture used for the legendary Radeon 9700, the X1000 series added full DirectX 9.0C compatibility, more shader units, and new technologies for the future. And the X1800 XT was pretty well packed. Its R520 GPU sports 8 vertex shaders and 16 pixel shaders, along with 16 texture mapping units and 16 render output processors. Vertex shaders on the X1000 series are basically a 4-wide vector processing unit paired with a 32-bit scalar unit. The pixel shaders consist of two stages, each stage with a 3-wide vector unit paired with a scalar unit as well. The first stage only possesses add and input modification functions, where the second stage features add functionality along with advanced multiply long and multiply add capability. Within each pixel shader was also a branch prediction unit, a feature required for DirectX 9.0C compatibility, and a key part in boosting performance and efficiency when drivers were designed correctly. Combined, there is 170 GFLOPs of total theoretical computing power on the X1800 XT when running at 625MHz. 50 from the vertex shaders, 120 from the pixel shaders, though either would be hard-pressed to actually come close to those theoretical shader rates. In response, key new features were an internal ring data bus and the ultra-threaded dispatch engine. The intent of both was to maintain high GPU utilization for more efficient performance across the 288mm2 die. In fact, the ultra-threaded dispatch engine could handle up to 512 threads at once. While these are not really threads in a CPU sense, the idea of increased utilization is the same, and ultra-threaded dispatch engines became key components to GPU designs moving forward. In total, the R520 GPU comprises of 321 million transistors, using a then-new 90 nanometer manufacturing process, and consequently meant 600 plus megahertz clock speeds were feasible with the right cooling. Onboard video memory comprised of either 256 or 512 megabytes of GDDR3 memory clocked at 750 MHz using a 256-bit memory bus, resulting in 48 gigabytes of bandwidth. This one here is 512. Overkill for 2005, but useful for later games as time went on and textures got more detailed. All these features on paper put the X1800 XT well ahead of its brethren, and had a high introductory price tag to match a $550 MSRP. The X1600 XT was much cheaper at 249 and with it much weaker performance. It was designed with a certain design philosophy in mind, one that emphasized shader performance not too far off from the X1800, but much weaker texturing and rock capability. The idea was that shader complexity in games was going to ramp up beyond the needs of texture and rock units, and it really was the unified shader GPUs that would take this to heart. While the X1800 XT was not configured in the same manner, the later X1900 XT was. But if you wanted the best in PC graphics technology from ATI in 2005, the X1800 XT was the go-to product, and it really shined if you could afford it and the associated hardware needed to make the most of its performance. This was late 2005 after all, and games like Call of Duty 2 and Fear were among the first games to feature multi-core support. And games in the next year would really start to clamor for more than one core if one was to expect reasonable performance. It's only appropriate that I pair this X1800 XT with an Athlon 64X2, albeit a later one from 2006, but an Athlon 64X2 nonetheless. This being a socket AM2 5200 Plus running at 2.7 GHz. With 4 gigs of DDR2-800, it's a pretty good base machine for a Windows XP retro computer if you want to run early to mid-2000s games. 
Plus it only cost me 10 bucks when I got it at a garage sale earlier this year. What a deal. And I have this 19 inch 1440 by 900 HP monitor that I also got at a garage sale the year previous. Playing games on Windows XP with a 16x10 monitor was part of my early PC gaming experience back in the day, and it makes me awash with warm and fuzzy memories. For me personally, this is PC gaming at its most comfiest and most nostalgic. As per usual, HI commissioned some pretty fantastic tech demos to show off the power of their new Radeon GPUs. The Assassin, starring ATI mascot Ruby, still impresses to this day with its massive polygon counts and insanely smooth, almost CGI-like illumination techniques. The backgrounds are much less intensive as to spare graphical budget to the foreground characters, but as a whole it's almost dumbfounding to watch 13-year-old GPUs produce such astounding visuals. It's not really indicative as to how games would really look, but it was a nice target for developers. The other demo, the Toy Shop, is more practical in simulating how games are going to look post-2005, and in many ways is just as impressive as the Assassin. A plethora of shaders were used to simulate water, rain, and atmospheric conditions to amazing effect, and just as fun is the use of parallax occlusion mapping, which would appear in games Fear and Elder Scrolls Oblivion, amongst others in the near future. Speaking of games, well, the X1800 XT was a pretty capable card in late 2005, only matched by Nvidia's G4 7800 GTX, which had a few more pixel shader pipelines, but the two would trade blows in the era's popular games. Depending on resolution, anti-aliasing, yada yada yada, but here we're just focusing on the X1800 XT. If you wanted to play games from 2004 and 2005, the X1800 XT was a fantastic piece of kit. Classics of the time had no problem playing all dialed up and rezzed out. 2004's Far Cry is every bit the bloody violent vacation it should be, and boy is it still pretty to look at. The same year's Half-Life 2 runs fantastically, though this is the most current version running on Windows 7, thanks to Steam dropping XP support. Then in 2005 there's my favorite multiplayer shooter ever, Battlefield 2. And it's handled like a boss, maxed out at 1440x900 with 2 times anti-aliasing. And then moving into late 2005, we started to see the first semblances of next generation games like Call of Duty 2 and Fear. Fear could be seen as one of the best graphics workouts of the time, because of its huge emphasis on particle effects, heavy vertex shadow volumes, and lighting to create hugely atmospheric tone, and intense combat scenes straight out of the best action movies. Call of Duty 2 took the original's formula and covered the game in copious amounts of new detailed shader effects with excellent texture work. It was a mind-bogglingly detailed game with all those normal specular and bump maps reacting to light and shading realistically. These two games came out at the same time as the X1800 XT, so it's not surprising to see the card handle them quite well. These were, however, transitional games coming off the capabilities of older graphics cards and the original Xbox. So what about moving into the next year, as the Xbox 360 caught on and its Xenos GPU started to be taken advantage of? Well, the X1800 XT was still doing well. Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion runs really great, even at 1440x900, though 1280x800 is more reasonable and heavily forested scenes could slow the frame rate down. It takes a bit of tweaking, but the experience is still fantastic, and still superior to the Xbox 360 experience. Unlike Oblivion, Company of Heroes remained a PC exclusive and still had a very scalable engine that could run on a plethora of graphic solutions. But if you wanted the full fat visual experience, it required some serious muscle. Which, to my surprise, the X1800 XT mostly delivers, unlike Rainbow Six Vegas which ran all over the place. I'm going to chalk it up to Ubisoft rushing the PC port, as there are very few graphics options to optimize the game to your particular GPU. So in a year, the X1800 XT was still doing really well. While not as powerful as the Xenos in shading performance, it still had slightly better texturing performance, double the ROP output, and the benefit of more memory bandwidth to its main memory. Xenos had half the memory bandwidth to its main memory, and was reliant on its EDRAM daughter die, which to be fair did offer essentially free Z-buffering and 2x MSAA at the 720p resolutions most 360 games targeted. But developers had to use it correctly. Something like the X1800 XT could in some regards just brute force its way, but once devs started to use more advanced shaders and denser geometry, the merits of the Xenos design and other new unified shader GPUs really started to take hold. And consequently, the next year, 2007, was a real landmark for both games and graphics. So can it run Crisis? Well, yeah, it can, but not in a manner most people would find acceptable. 
The open-ended gameplay is still here, but it looks so darn ugly compared to the experience of, let's say, an 8800 GTX can do. I am impressed with how well the X1800 XT does in such an unwinnable scenario, but it leaves me with a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. There is at least Team Fortress 2, though when the action gets crazy, the X1800 XT can have a bit of a difficult time, which in its current state is actually quite a bit of a ram hog, and definitely more graphically intensive than its earlier inception but still reasonably managed by a 13-year-old GPU. The game originally only required a Radeon 9800 Pro after all, though I doubt TF2 can run on one of those these days. Funny enough, Call of Duty 4 is much, much more reasonable than the previous two. With a 60 FPS target on consoles and not even being able to hit 720p in doing so is really just to the X1800 XT's benefit. It's a pretty good experience and showed how much respect Infinity Ward had for the platform where they started. So even after two years, there actually was some life left in the old X1800 XT. There was enough baseline performance to keep it relevant for even longer, as long as you kept your expectations in check. But there were still surprises like Rainbow Six Vegas 2 actually running decently well on the card, unlike its predecessor. I also tried out Far Cry 2, which is a decently optimized game, but well beyond the capabilities the X1800 XT provides. At the lower settings, it starts to look really ugly. Playable? Yes. Ideal? Absolutely not. Mirror's Edge is more graphically forgivable, and it still looks good with the main graphics settings reduced to low, since it only affects some of the special effects and post-processing elements of the renderer. Geometry isn't effective and consequently I think highlights the limited vertex shading performance of the X1800 XT when geometry is at its most intense, like in the beginning. It really starts to feel like the X1800 XT is hitting the end of its rope, but there is still enough performance to run 2009's Left 4 Dead 2, which runs decently provided the screen resolution is kept in check. There are still performance dips when lots of zombies get on screen and things are happening, but it's Left 4 Dead 2 and it's fun. What else is there? I guess a solid 60 FPS would be nice. And you're not going to get it with the newest game I tested the X1800 XT out with, that being 2012's Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Let's say the X1800 XT does not like CSGO, despite being a DirectX 9.0c title, but the X1800 XT was already 6 years old. Like other Source games shown earlier, the state of the game is not the same as the original Inception. Hell, it's not even the same as two years ago when I tried it out with the X1600 XT. Look at the shadow samples! Something odd is going on here, and I suspect some implementation in the API is broken, or the X1800 XT simply can't handle whatever newer technique Valve is trying to use here. Eventually you just have to give up, and despite a heavy $550 introductory price tag, I would say that by 2008 the X1800 XT really lost its usefulness for mainstream PC gaming unless you could stomach low settings at 720p. Mainstream options of 2007 like Radeon 2600s and GeForce 8600s were immediately just as capable in 2007 games, and later titles would take advantage of their extra shader performance and efficiency of being a unified shader architecture. In balance, it highlights how fast hardware and software was moving to meet the expectations of games and developers alike. In early 2006, ATI unleashed the X1900 XT with three times the pixel shaders as the X1800 XT, emphasizing what they were already trialing with the X1600 series, a focus on more shader performance versus the number of available texture mapping units and ROPs. But what was the point when unified shader graphics for PCs was to arrive by the end of the year? There is quite a bit of irony in ATI's own Xenos helping to kill off their more traditional designs, but Xenos was based on a lot of the technology created for the X1000 series, like using its vertex shader architecture as the basis for Xenos' unified shader design. And at certain points, entities at times must back on their own developments to advance on more promising technologies in order to survive market uncertainties. Xenos was a radical new approach, and ATI had already been experimenting with an R400 based unified shader design that did not come to fruition. The uncertainty of employing unified shaders at this point made the reliance on the more traditional X1000 series a more prudent move. Unified shaders require a bit of extra silicon to enable their benefits, like the ability to handle all shader processes across the same shader units, and increased loopback operations necessary for multiple efficient processes at a per pixel level. At the 90 nanometer node, and with a 300 million transistor budget, the advantages of unified shader architecture started to outweigh the achievable processing density found in, oh, let's say, the X1800 XT. The Xbox 360 also benefited from being a more closed box, 
not fully grounded by the conventions of PC graphics and the state of the DirectX API. Obviously, the X1000 series could not enjoy the same situation. And in conclusion, the X1800 XT, though highly dated, was very much an appropriate product of its time. Its delayed release probably had a bigger impact more than its own architecture, or the pending release of the much more powerful X1900 XT. It was meant to release in summer 2005 to fight the NVIDIA GeForce 7800 GTX directly, but ended up being delayed into fall because of a hardware bug. Consequently, the 7800 GTX would be the king of the hill for a substantial period that included the release of Battlefield 2, while offering superior performance to ATI's X850. Even with the X1800 XT launched, the GeForce part could still beat it in many specific games, and Nvidia also reduced the price as they prepared to release their GeForce 7900s. The delay likely hit ATI really hard, with Nvidia gaining a faster cadence and with it market agility, forcing ATI to react in accordance to competitive pressures which in most years is typically the case when it comes to Radeon parts. Regardless, I wish I had something of this caliber in 2005 and 2006 when all I had was a laptop with mobility Radeon X600 graphics, not even a quarter as powerful as this puppy. Aside from my gripes about Steam not being on XP anymore and having to use Windows 7 for those games, I only had two real issues with the X1800 XT. One was the high temperatures, 80 degrees Celsius in fact at some points, even after replacing the thermal paste. The other issue was some weird frame time fluctuations. That probably just stems from an era when frame time really wasn't a thing being measured. It's possible having to use Windows Vista drivers for Windows 7 might have been an issue, but I noticed the frame time hitches in Windows XP also. I guess it just exemplifies how important frame time really is, and generally if you can keep the FPS really high, it helps to deal with the frame times to a degree. For the former, the X1800 XT was a great card for its era's games, and even with games a couple years later if you tweaked it well enough. However, it sort of just got lost in the sea of new developments as technology was moving so fast and other products stole its thunder, like the 7800 GTX and ATI's own X1900. It's hard to call the X1800 XT a classic, but I really enjoyed my experience taking a close look at this graphics card. A lot of time and research goes into setting up the hardware games and making hardware chronicles, but in the end I come out with a much better perspective. The X1800 XT was no exception. Hopefully you gained some new insight as well, but most of all I just want to thank you for watching. But speaking of classics, I have a truly, truly, truly classic graphics card for you guys for Hardware Chronicles Episode 5. The most important graphics card since the release of the original NVIDIA GeForce. Can you guess what it is? I'll be back with Hardware Chronicles 5 when it's ready.